Well, we're continuing tonight in these uh, series of messages on the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus. And in them we see indexes to Christ's ministry and character. Now, from time to time in these, I'm going to take a little time to define the words that we're using and why we're using them and how they're used in Scripture. Because I don't, I don't want this just to be an academic lesson, you know, on miracles. <laughs> 5,000 facts about miracles or something like that, but to actually see the significance of them. We are going to fasten tonight on a rather vague reference to miracles found in the second chapter of John right after his first beginning of his miracles, which is turning the water into wine. This is John the second chapter, verse 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So as you can see, these are not specified miracles, but it was a cluster, little cluster of miracles that took place at this time. Now, in defining the word miracle, there, is, there have been some that have made quite a point of this, but I want to take a moment to define them. A miracle actually means a sign or a mark or a token. That is, it's a means by which Jesus made himself known. There's a purpose for it. The purpose of the miracle was not merely to in, say in healing to, make, to resolve healing or say in feeding to provide bread. That wasn't the real purpose. The purpose was deeper than that. Amen. Although, they, although he was mindful of people. A miracle is something that transcends the common course of nature. It's something that if God doesn't do it, it, it can't be done. And of course it goes without saying that if, if the time has, has ceased, when God works transcendent or above nature, we all in very precarious situation, if that is the case. But I want to emphatically say it's not the case. This word miracle also is called signs, is used in several places in Scripture. Jesus spoke, he, he upbraided people because they didn't know the signs, it's that same, same word, of the times. There were, in other words, there were supernatural evidences. That we're all about that yeah. this was the time when Jesus was there when the when the Savior drawn nine God was about to open the door of salvation and some people were just they just didn't know what, what was happening and you will find that we, I don't know if we'll do this in this series of messages but I've spent some time tracing that miracles throughout history were like in little clusters there were periods like centuries when nothing happened but what they were they were always saying some big epo epoch was at hand. And all of a sudden, this would break out when God is about to do something not very unusual. The clusters of them. It's also used signs when Jesus spoke about the false Christ and false prophets that would <clears throat> show great signs and wonders. So the miraculous is not confined to God. Well, in a sense, it is. Let me be more specific. There, it's under God's supervision, but there are very, very genuine. Miracles that are called lying signs and wonders. It doesn't mean that they weren't real signs and wonders. It means they let they had a wrong point to them. Right. They were leading the wrong place. And it, he, Jesus used the same word when he talked about the there were diverse signs that would indicate the end of the world. And as the world began to wind down, there'd be supernatural occurrences. So this uh, this is used several times in Scripture. My point now is that there's a purpose behind miracles. Now let me elaborate just a little bit on this. <clears throat> there have been different purposes for the supernatural in Scripture. Is there were like a way God has of getting people's attention. And that kind of day hasn't ceased. Make no mistake about this. The time when God's getting people's attention hasn't ceased. Right. And there's no indication that it ever shall until the end of the world. Mm -hmm. How could God draw people if he can't get their attention? Right. For instance, when the Moses went down to Pharaoh, God told him he, he was going to work some signs there. 
Here's what he said in Exodus 4, 9 to Moses. It shall come to pass that if they will not believe also these two signs, either hearken unto thy voice that thou shalt take the water of the river and pour it upon the dry ground, and the water that thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry ground. You remember how he threw down his serpent? There was that. Threw out his rod and it became a serpent. There was signs. But see, the purpose was to, <laughs> was to notify Pharaoh and his company that this is no ordinary man standing before you. And in Moses, he was concerned. He went down to Israel. How will they know that I'm from God? There, he knew how obstinate they could be. You know, they were like church folk, just obstinate. And here's what God told him: Exodus 4:30. Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto the people and did the signs in the sight of the people. That was the case where of this rod again, becoming a, a serpent. And it was also, he put his, put his hand, you remember, in his bosom and took it out of the leprous. He put it back in, took it out, it was not. And the people believed. It was, it said, it was the purpose. When they had heard the Lord had visited the children of Israel and had looked upon their affliction, and they bowed their heads in worship. So, Moses came with a message to them and he gave these two miraculous signs that confirmed this is really a word from God. And God worked signs to confirm Pharaoh's heart was hard. He told Moses, he said, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I believe he refers to this about 14 times. About Pharaoh's heart being hard. Four of them said that Pharaoh would harden his heart and all the rest of them were God was going to harden. Here's what he said in Exodus 10.1. The Lord said unto Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these signs before them, that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that they may know that I am the Lord. Ah, so here he worked these signs of the, so the coming generations of the Israelites would know about. Here's how hard a person can be. I can pour ten plagues out on them and they still won't believe. And they'll still chase you down to the Red Sea and try and go through the Red Sea after you. See? Science. Well, here's the purpose behind it. Jesus said, or well, Mark said of the disciples when they went out preaching the word, they went everywhere and preached, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Oh, I just love the sound of this. And confirming the word with signs following. Now they come out with a message that <laughs> quite candidly was different than anything the people had heard before. You've got to be able to put this in today's context. God has given us some things to say that some people never have heard before. Because yeah. you want to think and <laughs> this is God's manner to show this is a genuine message. It's coming forth. And of course miracles validated Christ's person. This it was the only thing they did, but this is what he did. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, ye men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God by miracles. There's, there, there's how God used it, or a sign. This is my son. <coughs> my son, my son, you should expect God's son to do extraordinary things. Why would you expect him to be like Moses? Or Jeremiah the prophet, he did extraordinary things. So miracles are not just a phenomenon, they're not uh, like a circus act. Mm -hmm. It's not like that, even though some people through history considered them that way. They'd flock out just to see some great thing done, you know. Now in our text, Jesus is at the Passover. The Passover was an extended period of time. It was followed by seven days of Feast of Unleavened Bread. You read about that in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. The Passover meal was the last meal the children of Israel ate in Egypt. So I was, that's their farewell meal. And they ate a deliverance meal before they were delivered. How about that? You would think you need a deliverance meal after you were delivered. But in this case, they ate it before they were delivered. Yeah. And it was the last of that last of Egypt. What a blessed thing to remember. Now this Passover, uh, Jesus did a number of things at the, at the Passover. For instance, the Passover feast was the first time it kind of leaked out that Jesus was a most unusual boy. 
12 years of age, when they went to Jerusalem, was at the Passover, the same, same feast. Luke 2.41 says his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So see, this Passover was a key time in Christ's, mm -hmm. Christ's life. And now we're at the beginning of his ministry. This is the beginning of his ministry in John 2. And he goes back at the time of the Passover. John, the second chapter, verse 11, tells us, This beginning of miracles did Jesus and Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. And verse 13 says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand. So this is, here's the Passover again happening. In other words, this is like a God-ordained environment. Yeah in which the hearts of people were elevated above the norm. When their minds are being disciplined to think of deliverance and divine workings and this sort of thing. Yeah. And Jesus uh, capitalized on that occasion more than, more than once. Also, the people had all flocked into the Passover. They came from all, all regions and around the time, around the world even. And so this is confirming that God's making a salvation for all of his people. I wasn't at there during just one of the conclaves of the priests or the meeting of the Sanhedrin. It was at the Passover when all the people were brought in. And what God was doing, he was confirming with signs mm -hmm. that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. Peter refers to this also in Acts the 10th chapter and verse 38 where he... Uh, he mentions that Jesus was confirmed by these very various miracles. Now at this Passover feast, Jesus confirmed that God was actually had actually sent him. He was actually from from God. The scriptures tell us in John 5 36, I have greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father has given me to finish the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Well, this is what we're going to what we read about in our text with some of those works. His works was not like works like people think. These were miraculous works he's talking about. Mm -hmm. These weren't the works they were. He was subject to his parents. That, that's what the law required. But this, that wasn't what manifested him. And, uh, he was a diligent worker. That, that isn't what... What made him known? It was these miraculous works that confirmed he was a miraculous child and a miraculous savior. And at this point, when his when he began to work these works, a separation of the people. This is another thing that happened with Christ's miracles that began to divide the people. If he had just remained a carpenter or mm -hmm. just remained a feeder of the poor, maybe as ordinary people do, but the, the, the distinction would have been known. But John. Uh, 1524 says, If I had done not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. So here's another reason for his miracles. And as I understand, this is a consistent trait throughout, whether it's today or whether it was then. When the Lord bears his arm, it draws it puts a dividing line between people. Some people praise God and it brings out unbelief in others. Mm -hmm. And they'll say something like, well, the doctors must have misdiagnosed it. That's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, well, you can't just trace that back to God. That's just coincidence. Well, see, these are not innocent statements. Right. Amen. These really are not. And we should not treat them as though these were just innocent statements by well-meaning people. They're not innocent statements by well-meaning people. They're evidence of unbelief. And Amen. one of the purposes of Christ's miracle was to bring this out. Mm -hmm. Amen. To show what people's heart was inside. He knew it already. Uh -huh. But it was important that we know it. <clears throat> and now we already, we, we're ready when he, when he was 12, he was at the Passover. Then about midway in his ministry, in John the 6th chapter, he's at the Passover again. And this was the occasion where he fed the 5,000. This was during the, during the Feast of the Passover. John 6, 4 says, the Passover, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? So see, that was during the Passover. 
Just as so like whenever the Passover came, Jesus was there. And here was an occasion where he worked a great miracle. And the Passover, this is when he died, too. He died during the Passover. And as several texts in John point this out to us. John eleven fifty five. And this is where this, the Gospel of John begins to wind down at the 11th chapter. Would you believe that? It starts to wind down. That's the last few days of Christ's life start in the last of the 11th chapter. Which is a half, more than half the book uh -huh. is devoted to that period of time. John 11, 55, the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So but God was setting the stage for the death of Christ. John 12, 1, Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. He was there. So this, this is winding down. I'm showing sure it when he died. He was at the Passover also. John 13, when the feast of the Passover, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world into the Father. See? Time of the Passover. I'm showing here that just Mary, these miracles, this little cluster of miracles, were strategically worked yeah. during this time of heightened uh, conscience among the people. It's, a, it's kind of a miserable comparison, but it sits to be similar to something like at Christmas time, when everybody, when people were thinking about singing the Messiah, and were kind of, or maybe at Easter time, when people thinking about the resurrection of the dead. We, perhaps it's a good to seek the Lord to particularly unveil Himself during these times of people's conscience kind of elevated higher, higher than it normally would be. John the 19th chapter, which deals right at the time Christ died, it was at the preparation of the Passover, about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So this trial's going on right, right during the Passover feast. In fact, that's why Jesus, they asked him to take him down from the cross, because it was a holy day. Remarkable. And Christ, of course, is called in Scripture, our Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So this uh, cluster of miracles was wrought at the time of the Passover when there, there were unusual thoughts about God, so he works unusual works to point to his Messiah. They were designed to draw attention to the person of Christ up and above the Passover. Ordinary, ordinarily, remembering the deliverance from Egypt was, a top, was of top priority. Now comes a man on the scene that dwarfs yeah. the deliverance from Egypt. And now that he's going to call him up to a higher consideration. It would have been out of order any other time. A miracle at Passover would have been out of order. It would have been out of order for some prophet to come along and work some signs and wonders during the Passover and draw people's attention away from this great feast of remembrance that God himself had ordained. But, ah, this was a different time. That's right. This was a different time now. Incidentally, uh, the thought occurred to me, oh, the bane of human curiosity... People just kind of want to check things out to see what it's like. And kind of curious to see what it's like. Well, Jesus sure gave something that transcended anything curiosity ever thought it'd see. Amen. Now the text, uh, these miracles aren't specified that, uh, that our text mentions. <laughs> it does say that many believe in his name because of these miracles. And I want to take a moment about this believed in his name. There's a critical distinction here that differs from the believing on his name that saves the soul. It's a little critical distinction here. To believe in his name, like what does that mean? Remember these miracles provoke people to believe in his name. That's, well, what does it mean to believe in his name? Well, God has given hints throughout Scripture about what this means. One thing that it means is that God hymns in His name means in, in Christ Himself. Yes, amen. In other words, the, the, the attention was drawn away from what He did to who He was. Mm -hmm. See, now there's a difference here. Mm -hmm. There's a difference, for instance, if you hear a great speaker of some sort, a preacher, if you, you're impressed by what he says or whether you see he's a person of great faith like Paul or somebody. There's a difference in those two things. So Jesus is drawing attention to who he was. Psalm 20 and verse 1 says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name 
of the God of Jacob defend thee. Well, what's that? What is the name? Of? Well, it's not like an appellation. That's not what's going to defend you. The word Jehovah is not going to defend you. It's his person. His name's his person. Just as uh, the closest association you have between a, uh, an apple and the next thing that's like it is the word apple. That's the thing that makes the closest association. And the name of the Lord is a way of scripture way of saying that his person looms out. Bigger than anything else. Also, the, the titles of the Lord that are peculiar to him are meant by his name. Mm -hmm. Amen. That distinguishes him. Exodus 3.13 Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and they shall say unto them, The God of our fathers, your fathers, has sent me unto you, and they shall say, What's his name? Hmm. That's, <laughs> the thought just occurred to me, and I was reading that. This, this would be a good thing for us to so teach that will provoke people to say, What's his name? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's his name? What shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thou, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> Amen. In other words, there isn't anybody else. Yep. You really will not get down to the bottom line. You aren't. You were created. You're going to have an end in the flesh. It says, I am. So his name points to a qualities that are uniquely his. They do not belong to anyone else's. Another is his various perfections and his character are intended by his name. And the Lord passed before him, Moses, Exodus 34, 6, and proclaimed the Lord, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And God had told Moses in the first latter part of the 33rd chapter, I'll declare my names. It was his person. Point out what it means to believe in his name, who he was, mm -hmm. which means his miracles pointed out who he was, yeah, amen. what he really was. They had an intent behind it. They had a message that was going through to them. <clears throat> and again, uh, John 17, 26, Jesus said in his uh, prayer to the Father, I have declared unto them thy name. Well, it wasn't that he just gave an academic lesson on the various names of God. That, that's not what he meant. He meant, I've, I've unveiled who you are to them. So they believed in his name. They, they saw more clearly who he, who he was. Mm -hmm. Up until that time, he was just, you know, the son of Mary and Joseph. That's, how, that's what they thought. He was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. Again, believing in his name, there's certain qualities to the name of the Lord that that are really qualities of his own of his own person, who he really is. Psalm 72 and 17 says, His name shall endure forever. And why is it that his name will endure forever? Because his name tells you of him. He endures. He endures forever. So ever you hear God or Jehovah or our Father which art in heaven or the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you begin to think of forever, see, and associate it with that. Showing here why they believed on his name. And there are transcendent qualities about his name. Tells them how transcendent or above everything else that he is. <laughs> Revelation 19.16 says of the Lord Jesus, He hath on him a vesture or a clothing, and on his thigh a name, a name written, mm -hmm. King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. That's what he is. Yeah. See? With God is named what he is. Mm -hmm. And again, is is powerful. His name is associated with power, authority. Philippians 2.10 says that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Amen. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. See, and eventually this is going to happen. The, at the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, now the salvation enables you to do this now. To some degree, but eventually, everyone, when everyone, when Jesus is presented as He is, mm -hmm. in all of His glory, everybody's <laughs> going to bow. Amen. Because right. this is really who He is. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We are, we are, those of us who speak publicly must acknowledge that 
we feel sometimes very incompetent to present Christ right. as he really is. It mm -hmm. seems like we always come short. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why we try and stick with the word of God and tell what he said about him because it's just, he's more than words can say. Mm -hmm. But someday he's not going to be more than words mm -hmm. can say. Everybody's going to see him as he is. And at that point, they will all bow mm -hmm. and acknowledge the power in his name. And I, of course, there's the Davidic expression, holy and reverend. Mm -hmm. is his name, mm -hmm. which means his person demands respect. Yeah. The only reason he doesn't get it is because people can't see it. Uh -huh. That's, That's right. all. When they see it, yes. they're going to reverence. Well, these miracles begin to bring out who Jesus was. And they, they, it says they believed on him. They believed in his name. Now I want to elaborate just a little, little bit on this. <clears throat> It's, uh, my, it's my understanding is at this point they did not see Jesus as the Son of God. Mm -hmm. There's a little critical distinction here. Mm -hmm. This is why he said he didn't divulge himself to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, under ordinary circumstances, if you talk about people believing on Jesus, these are the people he divulges himself to. But in this case, he doesn't divulge himself to them, which means this is not the kind of believing in his name with which we normally associate that language. So they saw him as the Messiah or the prophet that was going to come. Now Isaiah, which means the people knew the Bible. Mm -hmm. It'd be foolish for someone who didn't know the Bible to connect him with being the Messiah. These people knew about the Messiah. And, uh, and there wasn't that much percentage-wise in the Bible about the Messiah. You had to do some digging mm -hmm. to find these texts. So these people were biblicists, so to speak. They knew the scripture. And they believed in it. For instance, Isaiah said that when the Messiah came, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap as a heart, the tongue of the dumb shall sing. <laughs> then he took it into the spiritual domain, and the wilderness shall break out waters and streams in the desert. Mm -hmm. See, these people began to see these miracles, and they could just, this could very well be the Messiah. They believed in his name. <clears throat> there are other occasions when this, uh, this same statement is made. It's not the faith that saves the souls, I, I want to distinguish between these two, but it was like a beginning connection that this was no ordinary person. Yeah. John the second chapter verse 11, the beginning of miracles did Jesus and Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him. Well later they would say such things as, what manner of man is this? See, so this wasn't like a deep, if there is a thing as surface believing, this is what it was. It was they were connecting him with, with the Bible. Let's put it in today's language. They were connecting him with the Bible, but now you've got to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. You've got, you got to get beyond it. He's the one they talked about. You've got to get beyond that. You got to get to the point where you trust in Him yeah. completely and fully, and that's that's the difference between being saved and being, just kind of being interested. Yes. I, I, I mean, this is my own personal opinion, but in my opinion, much of the preaching today is promoting old covenant believing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it kind of intellectual. Uh, you, this is what it says over here, but the life part of it is missing. Here's here's the same thing about people believing. <coughs> John 6, 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracles that Jesus said, uh, Jesus did, said, This of a truth is that prophet that should come into the world. Well, that comes a little bit short of who Jesus really was. It's true, but it's not the peak. It's not the peak. Jesus just didn't come in the world to tell us what was going to come. He came into the world to do something, not just to say something. John 7, 31, many people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Well, see, you could obvious. This is not, what he's talking about here is not the saving faith because they thought that when, they didn't connect them even with the Christ here. In John 7, 31, they believed in him, but they, did, they knew he was no ordinary man. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, brothers and sisters, that is the starting point. <laughs> you have to see Christ as not the ordinary yeah. 
person in the Bible, not as the ordinary book and all is. You have to begin. That's the starting point. And that's what began to happen when Jesus uh, wrought these miracles. <clears throat> now, the believing that saves the soul is of a higher order. Let me remind you of some things that he said. And as I, I'm going to make this distinction. That believing that saves the soul focuses on Jesus being the Son of God yeah. versus him being the resolver of problems. Yeah. Amen. See, the Messiah said he's going to resolve some human dilemmas, such things as the lame leaping and the blind seeing and the deaf hearing and the dumb speaking. See, these were a resolution of human difficulties, and they even thought he's going to deliver them from Rome. Yeah, that's going to be it. At last, we'll be free from Rome. This, this is how they connected Christ. But when the believing that saves the soul is, you see his relationship to God not his relationship to your dilemma. And there's a big, yeah. big difference. Amen. John 1, 12. To as many as received to them, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, yeah. even to them that believe on his name. See, it sounds almost like the text we had, but it's, it's a higher order yeah. of faith. You see his connection with God. Again, John 3, 18. <coughs> He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So this, you'll never see Jesus as a Son of God until you see him as above all other men. Amen. As long as people present it as though he's just a, like a superman, you know. Yeah. One of us, people aren't going to get very far. They'll believe, there are people willing to believe that. There are people willing to believe that. We don't despise this now. It's just a beginning point. But it is just a beginning point. Mm -hmm. Jesus can do this. Jesus can, Jesus can straighten out your difficulty. This is true. We don't despise this. But it can't end here. This is what I'm saying. It can't end here. It's got, this has got to be an indication to you that he's something more and has something more Amen. than that to give. Again, John 20 and verse 31. John writes, These are written... <laughs> these great signs and wonders because he said if I told everything he did we, the world couldn't contain the books mm -hmm. so if it looks like Jesus was busy when you read the gospel record this is just a small introduction yeah. to his activity but these are written that that ye might believe that Jesus is the son of God and that believing you might have life through his name see there is that name coming up again that you, when you see Jesus as he really is it's like a pipeline that connects to glory and salvation starts coming down. Amen. 1 John 3.23 This is His commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave His commandments. So see, I was connecting this with Him being the Son of God. In John 5, 1 John 5.13 <clears throat> These things have I written on you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is the faith that saves the soul, which was introduced by this faith that caught people's attention. Until a person is jarred out of the ordinary, he's not going to get any place with God. Mm -hmm. And I, this, is, this is the serious fault and flaw of modern religion, American religion is it lets people stay in the ordinary. Where they just think of today and how I live and how, what my difficulties are, whether I feel good or whether I don't, and they never get up above this. But when Jesus came into the world, he jarred people out of that. Amen. There had never been anybody talk like he talked. And no one ever did the works he did. And that was introductory to the Lord opening up the fullness of himself mm -hmm. to the people. So it was preliminary. <clears throat> to really see who Jesus is, it takes a revelation from God. Amen. See? But God doesn't reveal this to disinterested people. Mm -hmm. To people that have not seen Jesus, ex extraordinary, God is not going to make this known. That's right. Mm -hmm. You remember when Jesus said, Who in the man say that I the Son of Man am? And Peter, after they had told what the word around the country was about him, he said, in a flash of insight, it's like he's, he saw him suddenly. Thou art the Christ, 
Because that's what they first saw. So that's what these people saw in our text. Mm -hmm. the, the Christ, the Messiah. Yeah. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mm -hmm. So he took it further. He went beyond that, see. And Jesus said, oh, you're blessed. Blessed art thou, Son Amen. of my Jonah. Yeah. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you. You Amen. didn't learn this in school. There are no books of men that can show you this, but my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed this to you. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, until it's, it's Christ, you've got to see Jesus as Christ before you can see him as Son. Mm -hmm. See, you understand? It's what he did when he was among men that leads yeah. to you believing in who he is from God. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hide this from people. Yeah. Yeah, I come from a background where you really didn't talk a whole lot about the miracles of Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. This wasn't, you know, in vogue. I guess people just thought that everybody knew this. But see, what this does, this gets your attention. You say, wait a minute. Uh -huh. There's something here to pursue. Something here to pursue. So it was preliminary. Now, again, I'm going to affirm that this was not, they believed on him because of the miracles this, that they saw. This was not the, the best scenario it was a beginning it was good but not the best we commend anyone who sees Jesus like this but that's not the best that's not the ultimate he said that he did not uh, th then those men uh, he didn't reveal himself to them Zaddy. he didn't show himself to them because he knew all men what was in him in John the sixth chapter verses 14 and 15 after he saw the they saw the miracle of the loaves then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Mm -hmm. You say, Oh, that's a wonderful conclusion. Well, it's a beginning. Note what the next verse says. When Jesus perceived, therefore, that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain by himself alone. So, mm -hmm. This is not how Jesus wants to be known. Yeah. Amen. This is the, I say that because this is not what God sent Jesus to do. Mm -hmm. Jesus has to do with taking away the sins of the world, yeah. defeating the devil, reconciling men to God, making peace. Mm -hmm. But in order for people to be convinced he could do this, he had to show, he had to confirm, I am not an ordinary person. Yeah. You don't talk to me like you talk to the king. Mm -hmm. You don't ask requests of me. Like you do the high priest yeah. or some other dignitary. I'm above this order. And then, and then this enabled people to see what he really had come for. Thus the miracles of Jesus introduced him, showing him to be uh, above all else in order that he might do something mm -hmm. that was above everything else. Now one last remark about, <laughs> about this text that is rather vague from one point of view. Jesus is prone to work where people are more sensitive. Mm -hmm. Now, if you track through his ministry, you'll, you'll see that this is the case. The Passover feast, I showed you at least three times he was at the Passover. When he was 12, at the time he fed the 5,000, and when he died, and I don't doubt that the other year he was there also at the Passover. But this was a, this was a context or a framework in which God could do something. Now you want to be able to uh, connect that to where we live now, yeah. today. You've got to be able to make the transition. That if people just have ordinary church services with ordinary singing and ordinary preaching and ordinary praying and everything's ordinary, don't think that God's going to break through with something extraordinary in that kind of environment. This just isn't what he does. Where there's a heightened awareness of him, we sing for this reason. We sing songs to peak our, peak our consciousness of God and Christ. Mm -hmm. And we have exhortations and words and testimonies and meditations to peak our interest, to get our attention focused on Christ because that is the kind of environment in which he works. See, that's mm -hmm. what I wanted you to see. Mm 